Okay, hello everyone, welcome to this evening's episode. <clears throat> an interesting title has found me, an interesting observation has found me. About the title, I thought about the idea of God, I thought about how many people on this planet entertain this idea, and to how many people this idea means something more than their free will. And whether we give a personality to the whole universal activity or not, <clears throat> we are a part of it either way. So I thought of first the sentence, a piece of God's mind, as if the world is uh, an unfathomable, uh, is the imagination of the unfathomable, the inconceivable. You know, I found it very interesting that through the religious lens, man has descended. But through the secular lens, man is ascending. And what that means is, from the religious view, it's as if we made a mistake that we didn't know any better. From the non-religious view, this is how far the potential has just come. You see, one, one angle we have been kicked out of greater rooms, in another angle we have not found greater rooms yet. So from wondering about nature or the moment, that means if, if the idea of God is this, from the theological lens, this idea that it, its will is through everywhere. I don't know how many people <clears throat> have lived in countries where there's religion um, mixed with, with like, just very integrated into the culture. People on the street are chilling like in normal other countries, but their language is different. Their language is, is seems to be centered around the truth that they are not the ones moving themselves. You see, this is the faith of the religious man. Who am I when God is moving all this? You know. So, we are a piece of this universal movement where through the religious lens we call it aka God. Now I thought about the word peace and the word peace being interchangeable, a sort of <clears throat> in this sentence of course, that it's like we're not just a piece of some unknown universally intelligent activity, we are also the peace, you know? I wrote a sentence, to be honest, the name of this talk, if you look at the subtitle, which is in the chat section, uh, is, excuse me, is in the description section, section. I wrote, when you act like God, you don't learn from your human mistakes. That means, believe it or not, divinity is the dismissal of the human. As if like the person thought they were a drop moving themselves, suddenly through the they realize it's like, oh my god, everything's being moved already. It's the same sort of confu uh, not confusion, but same sort of question that arises when a person looks at a a book, for example, a whole uh, a book, um, a revelatory book, a book uh, considered as revelation or holy or divine. And when you look at the Abrahamic religions, at least, you notice that it's weird, where it's as if God created something, then what God created made a mistake to the creator. That means rather than God being responsible for man's error, man became responsible for his own error. <clears throat> that means it's as if uh, I want. I wonder why Adam and Eve did not respond back, you know, in the Garden of Eden. As if 
when we did not create ourselves, how can our mistake be our mistake? You know, it's as if nobody has ever sinned on this planet. It's all been God's will. Nobody has done anything good on this planet. It's all been God's will through the theological lens. That means the moment you see a truth surpassing everything, that truth can be non-local. That means the moment the person, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> Let's say there is no concept of God, but the person's like, oh my God, aliens. You know? <laughs> so, so there's extra, the extraterrestrial has become the invisible other. For some people, the invisible other is God. For some people, <clears throat> it doesn't exist. Only the visible exists. And for, for there, are, there are some schools of thought where the invisible other is really defined to creaturehood based on behavior, not from anything humans uh, have noticed. So God made man, man made a mistake, God did not forgive, man fell to the earth, then God became all forgiving and all merciful. Isn't it fascinating? And this is not to try to create tension for an abstract personality. This is just to say that man has to realize that the nature is piloting him and he can also pilot in nature. <clears throat> that means it's as if a human being trying to be uh, a god in a world of humans has missed the point that to be human is the most divine thing you can do in a world that is endlessly changing. You know, so many things don't make sense and have the potential not to make sense anything. I am telling you, anything has the potential to be countered. And so, this is the biggest clue of peace. That it's a state where the wars have ended. The wars of the inner realms and the wars of the outer realms. That means think as if in front of your eyes you're a human being going through the human struggle, the rat race, but behind your eyes <clears throat> you are an Aeonian ever-presence. That means imagine for eons you have wielded manifestation in different formats, <clears throat> in different eyes and different memories of those eyes. I have had moments in this life where I will be honest, I have felt like nothing, like just a mere object, just like trash on the ground or whatever, like a rock on the ground, nothing, nothing like that kind of nothing. And there has been moments where I have felt that everything is a more alive than me. I don't know how to say it, it's as if like my mind has been my enemy, has been my friend, my mind has been my servant, my mind has been my master, my mind has been the fool, my mind has been the wise man, but in the middle of this there is the mystery of the watcher remaining as life force goes forth. Pretty much before the idea of, you can say like religion was man's way of establishing a person to person relationship with the universe. People wondered about where people came from and the person was like, okay, I came from people. Then the person looked at the universe and could have been like, where did the universe come from? It could have arose from a personality and <clears throat> so many times what we think is a person's thoughts, they are harbored, accumulated angles of perception.
and honestly I'll, I'll just say it straight up the aim of this episode is pretty much these three statements a piece of God's mind uh, <clears throat> this one the audience hasn't heard yet forgive yourself so God can have a uh, peace of mind <clears throat> so God can be at peace and then it's it's the one where when you act like God you do not learn from your human mistakes or I would say you do not notice your human mistakes and to act like God it's actually it's hilarious because it's as if the way the mystical understanding of the idea of God is is that it's the prime mover <clears throat> that means it was as if like who's moving energy somebody was like God man <laughs> you know like it was that sort of resolution but the movement of energy is unknown and it's dances to become known it's as if we are unknown then we become known then we realize we're unknown but that unknown is not the same <clears throat> it's as if you can say um, how do, what does a person do where does the selfishness of the ego lead accumulation right the person wants This picture I have chosen for the wallpaper, this is the Aurora Borealis. This is our planet, ladies and gentlemen. This is what we are wondering if it's in our mind or if it's in or if we are in the mind of the unknown. You see, I feel something is happening something that it's taking me a while to conclude this and I don't know how <clears throat> uh, on proper how accurate I am but I would share I will share it I wondered why what was the meaning of life not just for a human being but for consciousness consciousness to itself can be an opportunity it's as if when you wake up in the day what is that when you wake up in the morning like what is that that's your consciousness has an opportunity to be animate so we can say the conscious waking state is a workstation Human beings, they can either be or they can do human stuff. Our ancestors, they were experiencing the outer realms. As if the outer realms, they started in the outer realms. <clears throat> Way before, I don't know.
our ancestors, they did not doubt their outer realms in a way where they had to live in it. That means throughout history, the opportunity to actually be a mind and live as a communicating creature. The opportunity has become more and more to become a multidimensional being. Back in the day, way more reasons to stay in a singular dimension. There wasn't the convenience, but now in this modern era, there is the convenience. And I'm looking at children of the world, including myself, and I've even wondered about how my grandparents and my parents have lived, and my ancestors. And I've noticed the trend. The trend is that we are shifting and literally in a, from a multidimensional angle, evolving more and more from being mobile and real in objects, in a realm based on objects, into experiencing the realism of a realm with subjects. What that means is we are a creature with a ability, <coughs> we, uh, we have a human body, and this human body has an incredible mind. This mind can overlay the whole body with meaning, pleasure, joy, emotion, whatever you like. But the mind surpasses the body and the mind has to wait for the body. And I would say the more our minds are impatient, the quicker we stop being human. You know, it's, it's, here's the difference. Our ancestors were human beings and they were, pay, they were paying more attention to the human part than the being part <clears throat> in a way because the human was new. Now the human living as an object on the planet has been experienced in so many modalities that eventually we went to a higher platform and we started to move on the planet as not just objects as subjects, as conscious subjects. Now, beyond the, the, where these conscious subjects can go, I feel right now we are in, we are standing in a world. But in the future, we will be the world. We are standing in our mind. In the future, we will be our mind. That means that 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 re delay of uh, like the inventor seeing the invention, then drawing it, then making it. It's as if that's too slow for a mind that is evolving multidimensionally. So the mind wants instantaneity, right? That's why there is even you can say ignorance, cruelty, and inefficiency, inefficiency and suffering in this world. It's because. We want things instantaneously, not realizing we have to walk with the world for a long time. You can say a human being is born free, a freedom without definition, but as the world is defined for that human being. Where did the freedom go? Where, this, where did the spontaneity go? Caged in the stories that the emotions will not let the archetype to be free from. You know, sometimes a person has to forgive an idea, a way their mind generates the moment. You know, that means it's like the, the, one of the most incredible realizations is noticing you're not perfect, which means the mind has imperfections. <clears throat> and contentment with the imperfection is the only way you can at least glimpse your perfection from the distance. It's like the person is looking at the clouds, it's a cloudy day, then suddenly in the middle of, a, in the middle of like two clouds, he, suddenly they see a phoenix, like the wings of a phoenix flap. <clears throat> and the person's like, I saw something, you know, and nobody believes that person. Until one night, poetically, that person is alone and the phoenix comes. 
and what can a three-dimensional being say to a two-dimensional being? As the Upanishad said it so brilliantly, not this, not this. We are living in a world of squares, but our souls are cubes. So we have to go from a singular belief of the two-dimensional into a multi-dimensional belief of the two-dimensional into a singular experience of the three-dimensional then into the multi-dimensional. So you can say this is how man is not no longer dividing and conquering. Uh, the species has reached a point where we are noticing what is singular in the moment. Existence is a singular wisdom. That means anything you notice about existence, it's all about how it's being here now. The here and now is just observing <clears throat> existence, really. But the multidimensional has to do with how existence is being intelligent. That means it's not enough to just know how you exist. We want to know how are we alive. <clears throat> that question surpasses an object that can't believe anything and a subject um, 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 that is believing. I feel there is no way a person can become free from the linguistic simulation until they notice that their will, their free will is a designer. So you see it's as if like phase in human phases in human life where you suddenly notice that you are a design of nature. Then you realize you are a designer in nature. And if you are sincere, nature comes and teaches you. But the way nature teaches you, that nature doesn't teach like a person coming and speaking. Nature teaches through you. That means the moment the person can observe their self in any moment. <clears throat> it doesn't matter if they are in whatever circumstance in the realm. They just um, notice their attention. And any human being that has an ability to just peacefully, in a very silent and still way, watch life happening as an event that they don't know. That is the where the eyes of the explorer are born. We got the thing upside down. <clears throat> we thought we have to know in a world filled with information. Really, we are just uh, uh, lines that are connecting different dots. Every human being is coming and looking at this world. Every philosopher is being born and looking at this world and connecting the dots differently. Existence can't be owned, like an object can't be owned by a subject. That means, let's say, <clears throat> in front of me there's a Tim Hortons cup, coffee cup, and I say this is coffee, this is a coffee cup. For how many eons is this going to be a coffee cup? Let's say after 100 years when I'm no longer around, people suddenly stop calling cups cups. Imagine they just change the word opposite. People get bored of calling a cup a cup, so we call it a puck. You know, <clears throat> and you know, I don't know, hockey pucks become cups. Like, do you see what I mean? Like, it's like just the reverse of the language. So, the language sticks around as long as there's an attention to accompany. Leonardo da Vinci has this next level quote where I don't know, I don't remember it exactly, but the imagery of it where he's saying time waits for anyone uh, as much as they need to. That means if you are, let's say, an art master, painter, or designer, and you're kind, you're kind of gone into this modality, into this mindset of <clears throat> um, building the once in the lifetime effort of the moment, or whatever. When the inner realm has gripped the outer realms better than the outer realms can grip the inner realms, the person becomes advanced. 
because the mind doesn't fear piloting as an object and a subject when it can witness itself beyond both. That means the human being just needs one glimpse in one moment to just notice how the object and subject are being simultaneously witnessed. That one moment is enough. <clears throat> that one moment will give the human being a glimpse of their being before they are human. And then the, uh, um, you can say the great work of eons begins. We are trying to be free from a world that we have created, so we cannot be free unless we recreate it. You know, in this modern times, it's very difficult for, I feel, a human being to be in such complex systems of information throughout the day and expect a happiness of a full certainty. Like, you know, there is a type of happiness which is the ostrich uh, method of happiness, where the ostrich just slams its head into the ground, <clears throat> into the dirt. The ostrich covers its eyes to not see like a predator attacking it, you know. You know, there is the height strategy, you know, where the person's like, they don't actually have the ability, they don't actually have the honesty to look at how the world is. It's like if the world was messed up right now, we should have the honesty to see a messed up world. If the world was a great place right now, we should have the honesty to see that great place, right? not being pulled by cultural stories that change throughout the generations. Really. That means it's as if they ask what is the human culture all about and the answer is it's only human culture knows, human beings don't know. That means culture is like a, a dancer in its, in its own room. It doesn't realize there's other dancers in the room at times, you know. The way this world is designed is like we don't have an intelligent civilization right now. We have a civilization <clears throat> under the false premise that it is intelligent when so many inefficient things are not being done. An example would be, I'll tell you an example. <clears throat> there is, um, uh, it's like a door, right? Imagine there's a store, okay? And someone, there's a group of people who want to go to a grocery store, right? Or whatever, <clears throat> some gas station store. These people go and <clears throat> they don't know if it's open or yet yeah, not, do you know? It's like so early in the morning, they don't know if the store is open, the gas station is open. So one person goes and pulls the door. <clears throat> the door doesn't open. The person comes back and says, hey guys, it's closed. Right, and the whole group is like, yeah, man, it's closed. But then they see there's, then one of the first people suddenly notices, wait a minute, that there's a car parked outside. So that means there's someone there in the building, right? <clears throat> and the person goes and sees that the door had to only be pushed. It couldn't have been pulled. That means if you push the door, it would have opened. But because one person went there, pulled it, it didn't work. Oh, no, it's impossible, you know? And this, all that group of people who were waiting outside because they believed they couldn't open the door because only one person had tried to pull it, they were waiting for themselves. A great actor by the name of Anthony Hopkins was asked, something I, I believe I saw it in an interview he was asked something about what do you think of people saying this about you and he gave such a cool answer he said what I think is my business what they think is their business and their business is none of my business that simple
You see, it's just, it's too strange. <clears throat> there are spheres everywhere. A book I wrote called Godlike Spheres. This world is geometry moving in such complex ways that it notices it is watching geometry and that's the mystery uh, uh, the station of mystery our species is at because we don't know what we are theoretically anything is possible it's as if like 8 billion human beings in one room of a cosmic mansion and the human beings are like yo guys i'm pretty good it's like dude it's like what if there's other rooms you know a philosopher says so the scientist is like no it's only the observable you know we even tell people there's an unobservable universe but that's just I've said something because really how can you have an unobservable universe how can you know it's a universe it's just too mysterious. You know, that means every hu human biography <clears throat> is like this. Born on a rock in the middle of nowhere, we evolved to a point where we began making mouth noises as, as apes, as evolved apes. <laughs> and um, these mouth noises became so real that it's as if we took in our imagination in one moment so seriously as reality that all other moments of reception of existence, the, the experience of the existential activity is kind of like pushed to the side. <clears throat> you know, Friedrich Nietzsche said, um, God is dead and man killed him, this German philosopher. That was an idea where human beings had evolved to a point where they could be responsible for their own individualism. It didn't have to be a force just beyond, you know. But the thing is that when man pushed aside the, I, the idea of a universal organism, <clears throat> an unfathomable universal organism, he subconsciously, you can't forget an idea once you see it. So subconsciously, the person is trying to be God. That's what the ego means, really. That's when a, 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 I'm telling you, all angry people feel like gods. To themselves, they feel like God. That's why it's so easy to be angry. Because you are not seeing any inefficiencies to the self, you know. That, like, anger is a perfect example that when you act like a god, you don't learn, you don't notice your human error. <clears throat> and I will tell you, to be human is not, is like the coolest thing a multidimensionally ever present being field of intelligence can do. That means eons of watching the universe, you know? as marbles fading that means imagine you were watching the universe you would just even i would say a different metaphor you would see just lights as if imagine you're a pilot in the pilot's cabin and 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 so you're all the lights of all the switches it's as if it's as if if you looked at the whole universe you would see all these lights going on and on And so I find that the moment we, <clears throat> scientists are still trying to figure out gravity, I'm telling you, when we find out the mystery of space, we perhaps will be beyond human to just want to survive as the human race. This is our world. This picture, I can't, I can't say, like, it's like, <clears throat> it's like, who said there's magic? The world is magical. The world is supremely strange.
there's a story of this farmer and this farmer uh, what happens is that one day his prize horse like this a horse he cherished you know this farmer in a village back in the day the horse runs away <clears throat> and I don't know what's wrong with the townspeople the townspeople come to the farmer and they're like oh farmer you're so unlucky man Look at this, you know, your horse, your only horse ran away. What are you going to do, old man? <laughs> and the farmer, and they, they pretty much tell the farmer, you're unlucky. And the farmer looks at him and says, how do you know? Maybe I'm unlucky, maybe I'm not, you know, maybe I'm lucky, maybe I'm unlucky. He says, maybe. And the moment continues on. Three days later, the horse comes back with two other friends, you know, two other wild horses. <clears throat> or let's say three other wild horses the, the townspeople are like no way no way <laughs> the townspeople are, are tripping you know they go to the farm and you're like they're like you're the most luckiest person on earth your one horse ran away and you got three new horses it brought new horses the horse pretty much ran away made friends and came back to the <laughs> to the farm right the farmer suddenly shouts at the people and it's like how do you know i'm lucky you know how do you know i'm unlucky maybe <laughs> The next day, you know, <clears throat> the farmer's son is riding one of the horses, one of the wild horses, and he falls down and he breaks his leg right in front of the townspeople. And the townspeople, the farmer's there too, and the townspeople come to the farmer. They don't even care about the kid who's falling on the ground. They come to the farmer and they're like, you're so, <laughs> they're like, you're so unlucky, man. Your son fell, you know, from, from this horse, you know. <clears throat> and uh, <laughs> and uh, nobody, the townspeople are not even helping your son. You're so unlucky, you know, the townspeople are saying. And the farmer keeps, there. there's incidents like this that keep happening. Like, and the farmer keeps, says, how do you know? He says, maybe. And the next day, for example, in the story, really what happens is, <clears throat> they come to enlist like people's sons, all the other people's sons for the military, right? Except they can't take the farmer's son to the to war because the farmer's son's leg is broken, right? And all the people in the town the village come and they're like, yo, man, we don't know what's going on, but you're the luckiest person. And the farmer keeps saying, maybe, maybe, as if fools stamp out of duality already. And you know, similar wisdom even follows in Sufism. <clears throat> I would say this is really an advanced being on this planet. Where they are grateful, this is in Sufism, where the Sufi is grateful for all the bad and good things that happen. That means not just the good only, even the bad. That means it's like, let's say the person, uh, their phone suddenly it is lost, do you know? Or I don't know, let's say their phone is found. <laughs> it doesn't matter how matter moves. Atoms have to be, you have to, it's like the, this is <clears throat> the advancement of communication where we give freedom to life. That means we're included in it too. I was like thinking of it this way, if I live for myself only, only I win, but if I live for the world which I'm a part of, everybody wins. You know, now imagine if this algorithm became global, this mind algorithm.
Imagine every human being on this planet was a pilot and you are a passenger. It's as if being a passenger, you're like, oh my God, the pilot better be in a good mood. Everybody say hi to the pilot, you know? <laughs> Everybody compliment the pilot, yeah. <laughs> Let the pilot be in a good mood, the pilot that's <clears throat> flying the plane. And there's moments where you are the pilot. That means if we can create somehow an ability for a human being to have a tolerance to let the some moments the world to walk first, then they walk. You know, at some moments they walk first, then the world walks. You see? We pushed the idea of our greatness from our outer realms by calling it like here's the hilarious thing the word superstition is superstition it's an, it's a subject hovering in the middle of the air the concept that means all ideas are hovering in thin air <clears throat> we are on a rock in the middle of nowhere i can't emphasize this enough that is the instant uh, permission slip for ultimate freedom you're in a rock in the middle of nowhere. That means how could people, that means how could we still trapped in our, underneath our atmosphere? No. Even though we have something, but the maybe a, a major, like our psychology is Gaian based, is earth based. I'll send, I'll show you a picture right now. Um, so I'm going to ask the listeners to look at the, a wallpaper <laughs> there's a picture I want to show you of where we're gonna get to this is this is what before we get to the interstellar phase of our evolution not before but it's 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 like after the Mecca phase that means we're gonna experience an incredible phase of human living alongside technology on earth then we're gonna echo that in outer <clears throat> space and whatnot So here's the picture, guys, hanging there. This picture is... There we go. Wow. This is the picture I was talking about. This is where we're going. You see that? <clears throat> so if people look at the picture, uh, look at the wallpaper, they're going to see... They're going to see that that's where we're going. As a species and we're still fighting over mind games you know it's hilarious it's as if language like an alien has possessed people to strictly just abide by their most immediate uh, egoic position and it's as if we are chess pieces that have forgotten about the chess board and forgotten about the chess game and have even forgot about the possibility of our movements you know, I feel that right now, it's like, um, what's the, anesthesia, I, I think it's called, it's like anesthetics, like, they, <clears throat> it's as if right now the species is numbed, right now we are dreaming, every, every culture, every person is dreaming, they are dreaming in an awakened state, that means don't think just because a person wakes up, they stop dreaming. The mind is like a film that's endlessly running. And it's a film that's being co-created as long as the named free will is concerned. You see, right now we're on Earth and we want to get out of it. In the future, we're going to be in, in outer space so much we're going to want to go back to Earth. Right? I would say people who, feel, who are tired of, let's say, <clears throat> there is this massive like thing where some human beings are choosing to leave the, the grand stage of human existence early through their own will. That means <clears throat> in a world of freedom, there is also the dangers of using a bridge the wrong way. But imagine all people who have lost hope for the planet, if they just lived in a space station for 100 years, they'd be, uh, sorry, not 100 years, for 100 days <clears throat> or something, they'd be like, okay, may, maybe, maybe I like it on Earth. You know, it's like the person's going to be grateful for just running on the sand or something. You know, when you've been in outer space that long. 
right? So we don't have even outer space gratefulness yet. <laughs> The body is an instrument, it is the greatest ally of the mind, and the mind is like the older brother of the body, and the soul is like the older, even older brother of the mind. That means when the younger brother doesn't know what to do, the older brother comes in. When that brother, when the middle brother doesn't know what to do, the oldest brother comes in. When the oldest brother doesn't know what to do, the father comes in. When the father doesn't know what to do, the world comes in. Nature, the will. <clears throat> None are alone, for how can drops of mind to forget the grand ocean of just human living. It's like we have, we're like bees that are just realizing we're bees that can build a beehive. Right now, it's I would say it's massive ideological costume games, even though Halloween is one night of the year, but <clears throat> it's been, I think, 250,000 years where we have been uh, masking ourselves. You know, that means society is a massive masquerade, like Venetian masquerade party. When people meet in society, they never see who they are. You know, it's as if we are masked by what we choose to reveal with our outer realms. <clears throat> and if we don't trust our inner realms, we can't even trust the outer realms. It's as if there's nothing to do with the outer realms. And here's the remarkable thing. An instrument... Let's say a guitar, it has no purpose. The guitar can't play music. It's an additional, it's like a 3D intelligence comes and picks up the 2D guitar and, you know, you know, rock stars are born. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I would advise the global culture to uh, transcend language worship and being a god to yourself and to put aside ideas that are heavy that means a person when they have to quickly go on a journey they can't carry too many heavy things and deep belief systems that have to keep the world in a certain way to be real they are like heavy ideas to carry in the lifestyle i would say if you're truly fearless you would walk as if there is no difference between matter and emptiness. That means space and matter are no longer <clears throat> um, yin and yang's uh, slapping contest. Life is an elemental performance and in this elemental performance the, the outer realm movement can echo into various meanings, you know, <clears throat> imagine there is um, one piece of cake left uh, at a table at a very like important gathering and one person just without even noticing that others may want that you know, they just take the piece of cake and everybody's watching. <laughs> and they, they look at their hand, you know, it's as if the left hand holds the cake, then the right hand slowly takes the left hand.
to continue. In 2020, uh, moving beyond the era of language worship to the era of advanced communication, which means human beings have played and lived through many simulations of having to know before they do. But now it's, a, it's an exploration where it has to be unknown before you know. A teacher that wants the student to be like himself is a fool. A teacher that wants the student to be his own teacher is the wise decision. It's as if our species made a mistake with the story it told itself, so every person has to step out of the, the main story they're raised in. And then pretty much it, it's going to be as if like we're all te had just teleported here like a, a moment ago. It will be a novelty of that immensity. The word God is a mask. <clears throat> it is a mask for the vastness of the universal event. To perceive the world only from the inner realms without being conscious of what is there in the outer realms is <clears throat> self-godhood. It's simulated, it's how language is simulating self-godhood. But to perceive the outer realms then to go to the inner realms, you can say it is the world. It is world-godhood. four states of mind the human being I find has access to. <clears throat> it has access to empty, uh, it, an ability to fathom emptiness, space, so we have the zero dimension. It has an ability to be individual and has the ability to be one individual event. So if all that space was, con all space was filled with matter that's moving, it's as if that's the one dimension where there is a singular 
form, the idea of an individual can exist. <clears throat> then we have, this is the one dimension, then we have duality, the two dimension, right? This is the state of mind where language lives in, and in order to have duality, there has to be a yin and yang, uh, war till the end of time situation going on. That means chaos and order are dictating. That means just like how we have night and day, imagine that that is an echo of what modern morality has become now. You know, <clears throat> that was the original voice where modern morality is like the echo of, of just uh, absence of light on the planet and just the presence of light in the planet. This is where a lot of suffering exists. Because if a person was in the one dimension, you can't suffer. It's There's just one event, one thing going on. If you're in the space, in the zero dimension, <clears throat> there is literally nothing there to have any response to anything. In the two dimension, this is where you can be a self and the world it can be like you and this, you, you. It's like the person is separate from the world. That means how I'm saying I am me is because I am saying that is the world and this is me. Pretty much the birth of this and that was the uh, <clears throat> the hard shell of the illusion of language. So right now, if we can, let's say all human beings were advanced at uh, um, uh, navigating in, in dualism. That means we no longer thought language was good or evil. We no longer thought that people were good or evil. We saw the world as an energetic expression on multiple levels. And with the honesty and the decency of just an unknown witness, we take steps in this world. <clears throat> because here's the thing, I will tell you, without honesty, you won't find your own karma. That's the danger of being dishonest. You fall into a karma that's not your own. In a complex world, simplicity is power. In a simple world, complexity is power. In an advanced world, power is not power. Power is just efficiency. Everything updates, our technology updates, our standards of living update. But the human psychology and the story we're telling ourselves, how much does that update? How much does the story of our life update really? That's so any person who finds a way to update it, you've noticed the unknown to re know. When it comes to religion, when it comes to the idea of God, when it comes to uh, the eyes of divinity, and the purpose of the mind, it's as if what is the purpose of <clears throat> different parts of a department? It's as if, what is the purpose of the heart? What is the purpose of, like, the brain? What is the purpose of the skeleton of the person? Skeleton, the skeletal system of the one. Their purpose is on one level an individual task they must carry out. On another level, they are part of something that they cannot be individual to. That means your heart is not individual. That means, let's say if the heart suddenly became conscious, the heart of the human being. This is a hilarious example where I'm saying, let's say that the heart actually became conscious and the heart was like, yo, where am I? And the heart was like, okay, I'm connected to everything. So it's not like I'm somewhere. I am where I am. 
<clears throat> so the heart realizes its wisdom is to work in accordance to uh, the laws of the natural body. That means it doesn't matter if you're a good person, bad person. If we were right now cells in the vein, uh, veins of a universal phenomenon, uh, a transcendental phenomenology, then it would be as if we have no choice. The laws of nature, it's as if like when the person's body gets a wound or like let's say you were in <clears throat> medieval times in battle and I don't know, you got a scar or something on your shoulder. The body would instantly send white blood cells to go clean the mess. <clears throat> so that's kind of like karma. That explains karma. If we perceive it as a universal organism, nature is balancing itself before man can balance how he believes in the nature is balancing itself. Pretty much it's a spectrum of an indirect ideology an indirect linguistic simulation. These are the options for you and me when it comes to truth. <laughs> it's an, either an indirect linguistic simulation or it is a direct experiential truth. That means who said truth is, is can be found in words. For me, all human beings have been meditating from the moment they've existed. Their, their attention has been somewhere, you know. When we surpass, that means imagine we become so advanced as a species, as a civilization, that we can be selfless any moment and we can be selfish any moment. There are authorizations. <clears throat> That means if, if, if the person is in a place they're comfortable, they f their free will feels more active. If the person is uncomfortable, their free will is like trying to be, you know, trying to be a turtle in a shell. Eight billion plus <clears throat> ways of looking at life and extracting truth. Every species is responding to nature. That means it's as if, like, look at the power of nature when it doesn't have a philosophy, ideology, or belief system. <clears throat> the bird builds its nest. Animals, they are open to the language of their ecosystem when they trust their natural instincts and that natural instincts means you have trusted nature, then authorization for activity occurs.
what can I say beyond really dualism? Then there's the infinite dimension. This is where we don't fear chaos and order. We speed them up and multidimensionalize them and see what happens. You know, I honestly, <clears throat> being, and when I look back at my youth, I honestly felt the world was something to know. But it's an unknown generator of the known. And we don't know which room the generator is in. We don't know if the world is in our mind or if our mind is our uh, is in, in the world. You know, and right now civilization is at a level of snapshot fighting. That means people take snapshot impressions of the moment which are actually self-reflections of their own mind. Then they communicate. Right, and so it's as if it's as if like in the, throughout the whole time, <clears throat> if there were silent people on the bench, like a auditorium, let's say every human behavior was a room. That means every person, imagine you are like you you are like around you is a giant auditorium in another dimension, right? Every human being imagine. So based on what the human being does, different uh, points of energy, different views come and sit in this auditorium. If, if the ancient said the mind is a lousy master, but it's a great servant, servant, if we believe anything that we see, the mind has become our master. So it's as if being unknown in an unknown place makes everything non local There is so much our species doesn't know. <clears throat> Just like we have technologies that first implemented, they're messed up. Everything, everything that's lasted to, to, into this modern age, there are technologies that have evolved. That means after some point, you can see ideas that, like literally having geometry. I personally feel there will come a ge uh, the next great language of all languages is geometry. That means everything we see from objects to subjects, they can both be translated into geometry. But you can't translate a subject into an object. By definition, they're in different rooms. There is no such thing as one language, by the way. Even when a person looks at the passion of what led the evolution of language, etymology, you see it was behavior. That means before people spoke, it was like people were just doing stuff. And after some point, nouns and verbs were given birth to. <laughs> so these nouns and verbs were representations of the outer realms, but in a different, in an invisible room. And so our species has been building the momentum of this invisible room. I call it the language simulation, the linguistics. And guys, in these talks, I'm conscious that sometimes I'm I'm re-emphasizing some things, but just tr I'm trying to paint. Like uh, sometimes when you paint uh, on a canvas, you may do a similar brush stroke on top of a similar brush stroke you you, you have done before. <laughs> I feel this is what modern <clears throat> um, nirvana is. The person takes the box of language off their head, then they cry for some time. Then they start laughing. After the crying is done, it's like after they see what they have missed out on, then they see what they 
can now have. We take the mask of the human idea off. We take the mask of every idea off. And we don't destroy the masks. We don't get rid of the past. We just take it off to notice we are not the mask. <clears throat> then from that state of some sort of unconditional presence of being, that means you notice something about your moment that whatever you do, it's there. It's like you can't do anything about it. It's as unconditional as like space. You find us a, 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 a truth like space. Then once the the linguistic mask of how the universe is a certain story of of a circumstance, when that mask is taken off. That unknown view automatically notices how it has been occurring. And so you become an instant feedback of it's as if like your mind realizes it hadn't seen something about the picture of, the, of life. And then the moment it <coughs> notices it, the moment it notices it, it becomes it becomes authorized to do something about it. That means the easiest way to find, <clears throat> uh, 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 you can say, like here's the thing, if, if life was all about preserving energy, then not doing anything would be the, the, the only thing, <laughs> the only strategy. Beyond the mask of language, it's just multidimensional life. And so we will just have more tolerance for multidimensional systems to start uh, breathing on the surface of the earth. <clears throat> and it's, uh, it's inevitable. I mean, like this is just pretty much, it, it's like code. It's like singular first. What do singular beings do? They go towards the multidimensional. What do multidimensional beings do? They either go toward the singular or they realize they were never multidimensional. That's it. You can do two things. You can be what you are witnessing or you can move beyond what you're witnessing then. it's pretty much um like how the, there's the saying in uh ascribed to christ where he says <clears throat> uh to be in the world but not of it that means you are in an elemental simulation simultaneously with the ability to subjectively move this elemental simulation like the subjective simulation is moving an elemental simulation It's like truth never left the room, the simulation couldn't see more than itself. I would say the, um, the advanced communicator <clears throat> notices that all communication is really like what the human evolution is. It's an advanced communication of the universal sector. So the universal activity is like some strange communication between dimensions. And the human being is a communication inside a giant communication. We're like a, a stream inside a river thinking that it's a stream. This may sound strange, but really what if a person was to go within, they would notice how they're being and they would technically have no thought. Like literally, it's like, who is that? It's like, if you're not a thought, how can you have a thought? You know, like who owns it if you don't know that who is?
That means let's say somebody tries something and they fail and the person's like, I'm never going to do this. I failed in it. It's like, it's a clear sign. I should never do this again. <clears throat> you know, and the person says, I can't do it. And the person, come, imagine somebody else comes to that person and says, how do you know you failed? That's the thing. How do we know we succeed? How do we know we fail when it's endless? It's an endless endurance towards the next uh, step. Like, isn't that what life is? <clears throat> it's just this endless walk. And in this walk, you have a sort of ability as, I don't know, a biological animal with dreams. <laughs> it's like, we're just made of matter, but we have ambition. <laughs> we are like <clears throat> immaterial visions of material positions. Anyways, guys, uh, thanks for listening. I'm going to encourage people to join the Discord server. Because the Discord server needs to fulfill its purpose too, guys. You need to help the Discord server. <laughs> And uh, I feel I need to share a story, actually. <clears throat> a piece of God's mind. So God is inconceivable, and we have minds that technically, again, by the th through the theological lens, are not our own. That means we are being humans, but we don't know how we're being humans. So we can't own it. It's like we don't have enough information to know that we are like the in, in, only driver of this vehicle. I will tell you that before, I it's one of the biggest mysteries of my own life, which to some degree I have dug into, <clears throat> but I'll tell you, it, the biggest mystery was who was I before I could remember. That means for me, like memories are rooms. They have always been like that. They are like events. They are like film snippets. And in these film snippets, based on how real that moment was to itself, a sort of self was sculpted, not sculpted, it imprinted. So think of it this way, that <clears throat> space looked at matter and matter was suffering and space was like, what can I do? I can just provide space. I can give potential. You know, and the matter looked at the space and saw the space was nothing and was like, what can I do for nothing? I can teach it how to be something. So you see, it becomes the effort of all dimensions, literally like a pilot on a advanced ship uh, turning on the engines and just the intensity of the engines turning on. It's literally like just the whole moment, the whole room of every person on that ship psyche suddenly transitions to Inst instantaneous content that means it's like this is something where in the future if hyperspeed travel is possible they need to give an advice advisory to the people's psychology probably a unique helmet has to be made right? <clears throat> because there is a certain point that if the human being can't process it doubts itself as a processor, that self-doubt and that doubt of the world eventually brings it to nothing, but because the being exists as something, you can't be pure nothing. <clears throat> that means, let's say you were an agreeable person, and somebody came and said, you're nothing, man, you know? <laughs> and the person was like, I agree, yeah, we're all nothing. <laughs> We're not things, but we are moving as them somehow. And people are not asking enough questions. And it's as if a story satisfied this, this, this giant mystery search. <clears throat> Anyways, a piece of God's mind. There was in certain poetry, the idea of God was given a metaphor as being this giant mirror. 
and I believe it was in Rumi's poetry, where this giant mirror had been broken into pieces and every soul of every human being was like a shattered piece of a mirror that was reflecting the ultimate every moment. <clears throat> and so there was this vision of like these, the mirror gets fixed on its own in accordance to the whole mirror's will, but at the same time, that was the archaic view in, the, in this modern time, man can assist. <clears throat> that means it's as if like it doesn't matter let's say if the person is religious religious person all the human beings on this planet technically are God's creation so you assist the creator's will that way by assisting God's creation right <clears throat> how how pretty much uh, it's it's hilarious because check this out in the religious narrative everything is God but then God needs to convert himself to know he's God in a certain way it's like, it's, it's, it's very, very, believe it or not, right now I'm noticing like very deep conception, right? And I think even deeper than that is where was earth made? As if what if um, uh, um, uh, uh, earth is a simulation in heaven? I'm saying this through, a theo through the theological lens. What if earth is... <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, was a sim is a simulation in heaven and hell is a simulation in earth. You know, there's this story about these Zen monks. One Zen monk, <laughs> one three Zen monks are sitting in meditation, right? One of the Zen monks and they're <clears throat> like trying to show off how wise they are, right? So the first Zen monk is like, I have realized that just as all the nature of objects are empty, <laughs> uh, it's our mind which is the true nature in the moment. It's the true reality of the moment. So I have realized I am emptiness. I am nothing. And the mind is the only reality. Right. So the so the Zen this Zen guy is looking at the other to Zen disciples and he's saying, I have realized I am nothing. I have realized I am nothing. <clears throat> then, after a while, like, I don't know, let, let's say a couple minutes pass, right? And they're all sitting there, you know, they're disciples, of course. <laughs> the second, the second Zen, Zen uh, disciple, the se second Zen monk turns around and says, <clears throat> I have too also realized that just like the sky has no edge, our beliefs have no edge, so every belief on reality we have had has been edgeless. So we have been creating the edge, you know? So I have realized I am nothing. Then the third, <laughs> then the third, after some time, the third mark suddenly speaks <clears throat> and says, I, I asked myself where my memories came from, and I realized before I was born, I was unborn. And so the unborn can't be a thing. And I too have realized I am nothing. <laughs> then the first Zen monk turns around and says, you copycats, I was the first one who came up with it. <laughs> Okay, I ruined, I ruined the punchline, but pretty much the monk the monk says, um, I came up with nothing first. Look at these guys copying me, trying to be nothing like me. <laughs> you know? That means they're trying to be like nothing. They're showing off how much nothing they are. <laughs> so in, in Zen temples, they show off nothingness. In urban cities where there's ignorance and confusion, they show off something. It's the dance of atoms and their potential, really. I mean, what else can you say? Anyways, <clears throat> there's a way where the person <clears throat> has to open their eyes to know their eyes are open. And then there's a person where before they even doubt, it's like the person says, how do I know this? Like they have a doubt for that. They person also should have, how do I not know this? They should have a doubt for that.
And peace is strangely a renunciation of what you never were. So there is that. Anyways, thanks for listening. I'll be on Discord for those interested to continue the conversation. Namaste.